Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, episode 28, and the final episode of the season, guys. And um, I'm joined by myself, obviously. We got Jackson and we got Sam. And um, so this week, guys, Sam's going to bring us up to speed with everything industry. Then we're actually going to give you an overview of where we're at. Um, well, sort of mid-COVID, I suppose, um, trash arts wise. And uh, then we're going to be having a discussion around Christopher Nolan films. So Tenant was meant to come out um, in July, like a classic Christopher Nolan spot. Um, but unfortunately, it's been pushed now to the end of August. So we thought we'd do like a, an overview of Christopher Nolan's films and uh, yeah, our thoughts around it, really. So without further ado, over to you, Sam, for industry. So at, at this point, usually we get the excitement of the Toronto Film Festival and Venice Film Festival's lineup. Now they have been announced, Venice is still looking to go forwards, uh, that's the um, same with Toronto, they're both still happening. The one noticeable thing you could tell from these lineups though is there are no Oscar players. This are they with is... guests then? With guests? Yeah, like people, an audience. There's, well, a good example of that is there's a film being screened called uh, Nomadland and essentially they're going to do, the, they're going to screen it at the same time in Toronto as Venice and then do like a virtual the the star be online yeah and that's from director uh, Chloe Zhao who's also doing at the moment Marvel's uh, The Eternals and starring Francis McDormand it's got a lot of buzz around it so it's clearly probably the only one I saw in that list that felt like an Oscar film the opening film for Toronto is um, the band Talking Heads did a live concert that Spike Lee shot so that's the opening film so it's not even your traditional film in that respect you know it's more of a theatre opening and a little bit different this year. Uh, Werner Herzog's got a new film out as well. Um, <clears throat> it's one of his documentaries that he... Uh, last time he did a documentary called Into the Inferno. This is a similar documentary, but it's about meteoroids. And it's oh, with cool. the same dude. And it's Netflix. So we'll get that sooner rather than later. But generally speaking, I mean, they, they tend to not announce all the films that start anyway, so there may be some more Oscar buzz films. But seeing as the Oscars are now done via screener, Seems like we're doing things a little bit different. So I'm kind of curious of what else we announce. But yeah, lacking those big names you sort of expect to create buzz. That's mm. the point of a festival after all. Yeah. Jordan Pill is teaming up with Isa Ray, who does the HBO TV show called Insecure, which recently did very well at the Emmys nominations. He's looking to produce a sci-fi horror film that she's set to star and produce in. And the brief description is that there is a mysterious sinkhole that may actually be a human being. So there's not too much on it. Jordan Peele's not directing this, just to make very clear. Maybe in the future, but I don't think he is. <clears throat> this seems to be part of Jordan Peele's monkey paw uh, company's commitment to try and um, get more diverse talent in there. So I'm kind of curious what he's doing with that. The one big mystery that's just exciting, even though we know nothing about it, but it has to be discussed, David Lynch is working on something. <laughs> <laughs> you love your David Lynch. It's genuinely quite exciting because uh, David Lynch, if anyone knows who's checked out his YouTube channel, he currently posts a video a day. He might be working in his office or he might put a music video or a short film. It's been a nice kind of refuge for a lot of people who just want to be able to, you know, watch new material from the guy. And apparently this is going to start slowing down because he's working on something. Is it a TV show? Is it a film? No one knows. He was spent a lot of time with Netflix at the start of the year, where they released the short film for his birthday. But what's he up to? I'm sure we'll find out soon. But any news of David Lynch with, is great. With David Lynch, it could be anything, because obviously could he's be. got albums, he, uh, he paints as well, does he not? He does. It's just, uh, this rings as a film. The, yeah. Like the producer, like they literally had an interview with one of his producers who said that one of the things they want to focus on, and David Lynch did it himself, was to have a more inclusive uh, cast and crew. He says it doesn't matter what race or background you are, it's all about who's right for the role. So them doing that talk makes you go, okay, they're doing something. Yeah, they're talking yeah. about roles and yeah. stuff as well. One of the greatest directors is going to give us another masterpiece. We've pronounced his name once, we'll pronounce it again. Luca Gu Guadinio. Yeah, I think it's Guadinio. Um, constantly <laughs> seems to be announcing different projects. He's got his new HBO TV series, but he's also just signed up to do Scotty and the Secret History of Gay Hollywood which is based on a documentary that came out a few years ago, um, specifically on a guy called Scotty Bowers, who was an actor in the 50s who was gay. But he hid it, and a lot of actors, like Gene Kelly, bisexual, it was those kind of ones, the really big ones who were keeping their sexuality 
hidden. That'd be really this documentary looks into it. The weird thing is that Seth Rogen's producing it. Really? Yeah. Seth Rogen, as we know recently, has been very much diversifying the kind of films that he's producing or directing or like even the TV shows. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what, where that goes with that. So as, as Ryan said at the beginning, we're going to tell you a bit more about what's going on with Trash Arts at the moment. Um, <clears throat> as Ryan also said, this is our final show, so we're taking a month off to mostly focus on shooting Senseless. I feel like that's like Simon says, Ryan says. <laughs> <laughs> So with Senseless, we have obviously been asking you to support us with the Indiegogo. We were very fortunate to reach a target and to go over, by, and on our final target was 1750. Senseless is shooting next week. It's a fantasy horror film. It's been a nightmare to put together, but we're excited by it. And we hope that we'll have some recordings for some behind the scenes for you guys to be able to hear when we come back in September. After that, we hope to shoot the film The Ordeal. The Ordeal is a project I have been working on since 2018 and it's been a bloody nightmare. But what do you expect <laughs> when you call something The Ordeal? <laughs> yeah, you sort of it's an ordeal it to yourself. Make. Yeah. <laughs> that was a bit senseless. The Ordeal is a film about mental health. It's a docudrama which basically looks at a young girl who died during an exorcism and how the family came together through loving reasons but in effect killed her. So it's something a bit different for us. Um, I'm going to be shooting uh, Pop Vox interviews throughout September and uh, hopefully depending on the old uh, lockdown a bit of October but I'm hoping that's gonna be wrapped we have an ongoing project called my horror story episode one and episode two are currently on our YouTube channel that is created by Jackson and we will have another episode out at the end of uh, August with Annabella Rich as our main star and then we hope to continue doing this with monthly um, episodes coming up and uh, yeah if I I mean, it's it's a kind of project that's open to um, any actor who wants to uh, do it, really, um, as as long as we can actually get together yeah. with them. So if anyone is interested um, and has acting experience or even just uh, storytelling experience... Good fear story. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's generally speaking, uh, it's just a, a monologue by one performer who um, tells their horror story. Uh, simple as that. It's kind of in the name. <laughs> As so if we, you're interested, give us an email, give us a message on Facebook, whatever. As we've mentioned, um, we have our website up right at the moment, trasharts.co.uk. You can check out all of our more recent films so that you can get links directly where to buy them. This will be updated with new trailers for the upcoming films. So please just have a little gander, get us some more hits. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel. <laughs> Keep up to date. And finally, we did it at the beginning of the year, Real Indies film festival we are looking to do that again um, hopefully once things are safer of course but we do we don't want to do it as an online festival simply because the whole point is for us that the films that we've seen at different festivals to bring them down locally to Portsmouth so we will bring this back hopefully spring next year um, but yeah if you want to keep up to date with all of our things check us out on social media Trash Arts UK and as Ryan said subscribe and um, I just want to put in there as well, guys, that thank you for all the support that you've given us throughout the whole campaign, the Indiegogo, um, for Senseless. We actually begin shooting tomorrow. Very daunting. And uh, the prospect of shooting throughout the night for five days straight is, is a little bit scary. But, yeah, <clears throat> we couldn't have got there. We couldn't have got to this position um, without your support. So thank you very much. So, guys, Christopher Nolan... Um, so Christopher Nolan is actually, well, he will have done 11 mm. films by the time Tenant comes out. Um, so of them films, <clears throat> you've got um, Following, you've got Memento, you've got Insomnia, Batman Begins, The Prestige, uh, Dark Knight, Inception, Dark Knight Rises, Interstellar, and then Dunkirk, and then Tenant. Yes. So really... What kind of defines these films? What makes them good? And what's your opinion on each of these films? What makes these films great? Well, let's, uh, let's take a step back and just look at Nolan as a director, like, just as his career. When we think of um, auteur directors, or even just the idea of a big name director, it's, quite a, it's a luxury that a lot of directors don't get nowadays. Mm. We start to see a few build up in that auteurship, but Nolan... He's literally, as they say, the internet's favourite director. Because he has such a strong fan base. And his films are so distinctively got like a stamp creatively as to what he wants to do. And many directors don't get that kind of like luxury. 
as it were. He's one of Warner Brothers' favourites, that's why like, he gets to do whatever he wants, and Nolan is very well known for, for getting things under budget and get it in on time. Mm. I think this is... Uh, he's a very precise director, isn't he? You don't tend to see something too messy. And if you've seen images of him working where he's... I think it's, it's in Memento where he's, he goes through how the whole entire story structure works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's insane. It's just this crazy like, maths, essentially. And I think that's where with Nolan, his films are a bit more mathematical in that respect. He may talk about chaos, and he does constantly in his films, but there is no chaos to the structure of what he's crafted. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, for me, I think... See, I've, I feel like I've gone off Nolan recently, mm. and not for any reason that I can particularly put on it, other than the fact that I feel like uh, uh, maybe he's become kind of stale, and, and that kind of makes sense to me in the way that you've talked about the mathematics sort of approach to it. Um, because I, I, I prefer things that are a bit more sort of Gun balls to the wall, you know, garish kind of uh, things that are, are a bit more challenging in the terms of the artistic format. Um, but at the same time, I, I loved so many of Nolan's films um, that have come out, and and it's only just recently that I've started to go. Mm. And I haven't seen Dunkirk to be fair, yeah. so like I That's can't a really. Great film. Yeah, so, I do need to one, see it. <laughs> so one of the things I absolutely love about Nolan, in every single one of his films, there's always this element of time. Yeah. And like, I, I can't remember exactly what film it is. It might be, um, oh, what is it? That basically that there's a time for, is it? I think it might be The Dark Knight Rises. They say that there's a certain amount of time until the bomb goes off. Yeah. yeah. And actually, the footage then, between them saying that to the time that the bomb goes off is actually in sync. So it's like two minutes thirty or whatever. I don't know if it is, but um, yeah. And it, it, there's always this element of time with Christopher Nolan, and um, I think that's just like quite cool of a concept. You think of Interstellar, as well. That the concept of time and like the years go past, and even with Dunkirk. I know you haven't seen it, Jack, but there's that element of time. Like what is it? One week, one day, and one month or uh, one hour. Well, this is the thing. The, the great thing that Nolan does. That is, is a difficult thing to be able to do, is he mixes that very much art house approach to playing with the narrative structure by not keeping it linear. Mm. But he still brings the big blockbuster moments. And that's why, like, what you were saying earlier about, he's, yeah, he is calculated, but you remember the first time you watched Inception. Mm. That whole experience was borderline mind-blowing. Because yeah. you had something that had some beautifully set up action set pieces with a hell of a lot of intelligence going on underneath. Bigger ideas. And sure, Nolan, Nolan kind of similar to Tarantino, although it's less vocal, does take from other films. Inception is, it's based, there's a lot of animes that have done similar things, and I believe there's a 90s film called Dreamscape. But I think all uh, directors are gonna find some influence somewhere. And Inception, you can tell, because he's got a deep love for James Bond, and that comes across definitely in Tenet, of yeah, course. Yeah. But um, with Inception, that was the first time you really got to see that if you gave him that franchise, this is what he's going to do with it. But I also love with Inception, like, it's aesthetic. Yeah. Like, um, everything's a set piece. So you kind of touched on it. Um, whenever they're doing the, the revolving room and everything's shifting, they actually did that. They built that and yeah. they moved it. And they actually ran. So there's a, there's a less emphasis on CGI. And it's all aesthetically pleasing and really cool. So it's visually, silly. it's it's awesome to watch. He's a showman. He's a, he has he has got showmanship throughout all the things that he's ever tried to like build. Even when we go back to like potentially his best film, it's always up for consideration. Memento. Hmm. Memento is a very simple story told backwards. Yeah. And played around and messed around to create more of a mystery. It's the time element again. Yeah, but it's also a very deep understanding of. The, the crime mystery genre as it is. Because Memento is a noir. It's yeah. pretty much a noir, and noir always plays with that. If you think of a classic noir, the voiceover is usually very much the guys woke up drunk, like, what happened last night? That's Memento. It's a pure noir that he's got to explore in his own... Uh, Unique way. Yeah, and, and he kept that consistent. He, even with the, the, the Batman movies, they still mess with time. They, st they still don't want to keep coherently. Now, N Nolan's always been accused of um, being quite a cold filmmaker emotionally because the cool element usually comes through. 
So if you think the way the characters interact with each other, they're always doing little cool little quips. But you don't always get fully emotionally invested in the characters. Which of course is also completely not true, because his lead male actor, they, you, 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 he has a very much an archetype of a male lead, doesn't he? It's someone who's got some sort of mystery with the past, they've got some sort of hiding of who they really are and we're not fully knowing who they are, but they're still the charismatic lead. So we look at Inception, we look at Batman. I would say yes, until Dunkirk. Yeah, Dunkirk is the one that goes away from that, but that, I think that's more because he, he isn't focusing on one main character there. He's a fo the, the main thing of Dunkirk is the it's event story, itself. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the actual historical but occurrence. That, in a sense, is quite interesting because Nolan has a very um, <clears throat> set way of having a lead and mm. they kind of play off the same sort of stereotypes. To not have a lead as such and let it be story-driven is quite ballsy. Definitely. That's, that's why, technically, like in my perspective, Nolan's best directed film is Dunkirk because he's not relying on the story elements. It is just, it's not... People always say it's a film that's removed from character, that it's not about the people, and that's where it becomes a bit emotionally confusing for people, because what do you usually expect in a war film? Yeah, but I would disagree with that. Like, I think, it, I've watched that film probably about three or four times, mm. and every single time I get drawn in emotionally, because you try and think of, like, the, the way that it works is that it takes away that character focus, right? And it focuses on, I know that there's, the person at the start that they follow and everything but it kind of puts him in involved with a load of other people who are experiencing exactly the same thing yeah um and they're going exactly through the same thing you're just another number so for me like watching that it was very much well what the hell would i do if i was in that yeah. situation it like allows you to relate to it more by yeah not putting the emphasis on yeah. one singular character because you could be any one of them people yeah and you then are like oh my god like what, what would i do in that situation that's why like, I have to applaud him taking that approach. I find more films to be, you know, they can be borderline patriotic propaganda. But with Dunkirk, he was more interested in the craft of telling the story than necessarily what's going on in the story. Or at least that's how it felt, because it's not a film that fills you full of hope. Maybe at the end, but generally speaking, it's just tension and like... Well, oh, even God, the music reflects happen? that. Yeah. It's just like loads of beats <clears throat> and there's that ticking clock, mm. like constantly going on. And it's like, oh God... As we're discussing uh, Nolan as part of a uh, auteur season, as it were, um, one reason, and we, we, we always have to discuss the auteur theory, but the idea, he collaborates, yeah? So all film is collaboration. So as we know, if you've got a Christopher Nolan film, you are going to get certain elements that are definitely going to be there. So as Hans Zimmer score, for instance. Yep. Although not on uh, Tenet, I think. Um, <clears throat> and then you've got Michael Caine, of course. Michael Caine's in every one of his films. So yeah, before his cinematography, he was working with Wolf Feister. Recently he's been working with Hoyte van Hayatona, um, <clears throat> who gives a real particular kind of style to it. Now, I think he would have continued working with Wolf, but if anyone knows, like, he made Transcendence, which nobody really remembers, that Johnny Depp film, that Bond I remember crazy. that. <laughs> which, which, again, weirdly, had all those traits you expect to see in a Christopher Nolan film, but no emotion the and no intelligence. The execution wasn't exactly great. And that's, that's the main key thing with Nolan. It's execution. Everything is about execution. And I think this comes down to his very dogmatic strictness with working with film. He is not one who likes to work with digital. And as you said earlier, he's a big fan of practical effects. <laughs> and if you look at, um, I mean, the, how many planes has the guy blown up? <laughs> <laughs> it seems to be a big thing. Every, every note of film's like, Warner Brothers are born a new plane to blow up. Do, do you know, actually, when you said that, um, the first thing that came to mind is, well, the soundtrack to The Dark Knight Rises. I'm not going to sing it all for you guys, sorry. Um, <laughs> I but, think they're glad. <laughs> yeah. But when they hijacked the plane... And that was all practical. They actually yeah. flew a plane above a, above another plane and then hijacked it and blew it up. And then it dropped and blew up. And it was like, that's fucking amazing. I think that's one of the things I always appreciate with Nolan. And it was, you saw the real difference between The Dark Knight and Batman Returns, Tim Burton's film. Yeah. When I rewatched Tim Burton's film after watching The Dark Knight, I couldn't get over the fact, like, where are these duck weapons coming from? Where is this weapon coming from? How did they build that? Nolan wants you to know that process. Yeah. Even if it comes down to probably one of his best set pieces, the opening of The Dark Knight Rises, with Bane on the plane. You're seeing all of the calculated actions that those people are experiencing at that time. 
because it's borderline. It's like a high sequence that then becomes a rescue mission, isn't it? Have you noticed? Right, so I'm actually going to ask you guys a question, but I'm going to say something very quickly. So I know you guys don't necessarily like superhero movies and stuff, um, but I want to get your opinion on the Dark Knight trilogy, just what that is. But before yeah. I do, have you noticed that in every single one of them Dark Knight films, so Batman Begins, Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises, the um, main antagonist always gets captured deliberately to further the story. Bane does it, Joker does it. Yeah, yeah. But it comes back to Nolan's calculatedness, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That they're always one step ahead. And in a weird way, Nolan's kind of making clear they do to it in you. different ways. Well, this is what I'm saying. Nolan's making clear to you, he's one step ahead of you. Mm. A director should be a step ahead of their director, uh, their audience nonetheless. But you feel it with him. Because you're like, oh, that character's way ahead. They know everything that's happening, but really, who wrote that? You know? You're always second guessing, yeah. aren't you? Like, um, I think we all went to see The Dark Knight Rises um, whenever it came out in cinema in 2012. Yeah. And I remember the first time I watched that, I was like, this is a masterpiece. Like, this is unreal. And the character of being, that voice. And even the fact that a lot of people criticize it, but the fact that Batman doesn't show up until 45 minutes into the film, yeah. it just builds tension. And it's great character development. And he doesn't want to, like, again, same with Dunkirk, and he definitely did it with Batman. Just because he's making a Batman movie doesn't mean you're going to be focusing just on Batman. Or the, it's the whole world around him. Yeah, but the, the hero, like, if you think about Marvel films, so I love Marvel films and stuff, but there's always this fantasy element to it. Yeah. Whereas with Christopher Nolan's Batmans, there was always this grounded realism to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you never felt like it was out of place or it was like theatrical or, you know, oh, that, that couldn't happen. Yeah. It was always realistic. Um, especially like Batman Begins and as an origin story. And to get him to the point that he becomes a bat and, um, goes out there and becomes a vigilante, you're like, yeah, okay, I, I get that. I'm on board with that. And I think that's why it appealed to so much yeah, of a yeah. different audience. And that's why I think you guys like it, is because it doesn't have that fantastical element to it. I'm not sure, though, because I like, I like fantastical things. I think with, with Nolan, what he did with um, uh, Dark Knight, the Dark Knight trilogy generally, is take comic books away from where they were in film and gave them like a respectability, a sort of... A, a, a sort of sheen to them that made them um, a lot more palatable to yeah. a, a more movie, uh, film orientated audience. Um, and not... I think that had a dramatic impact on Definitely. all of the comic book films around <clears throat> it. Like he he changed the way that people saw comic book films for a long time, and it, it took. I think um, Marvel continuing on the way that it was before DC was like, right, we've got to, yeah. we've got to try and build our universe. Um, and I think DC would have been more successful if they'd followed on uh, in the, that sort of like Nolan vein of focusing on authorship over over these things. But uh, yeah, I think that I, I think that it's cool that he did everything in terms of a realistic thing. But now I'm kind of bored of it in some way do you know what I mean because it changed everything it changed that's the isn't it though like when you have someone who completely re reinvents the wheel as mm. it were to how that genre is being approached whatever comes after it is going to make you go oh god it's another attempt to be Nolan again yeah and he even achieved that with just the fact that Hans Zimmer created the horn sound mm. which was then continuously yeah. used for every <laughs> trailer yeah, possible he, yeah he literally defined <laughs> trailers for that decade yeah. In, yeah. My, in my perspective from um, Inception like yeah. it was it was mad how many trailers you saw after oh. that just going boom and giving you these sort of almost like um, almost sort Over of extreme epic. bits of music that were, that were kind of horror-esque yeah. in a way that they made you jump out of your seat when you were... That's, that's another point with him. He's a very... Because of his preciseness and everything's calculated. Sound. He has a really weird way of playing with sounds. And I know there's a, there's a particular reason why he does it. I can't remember exactly. But the, la the, the sound's always off balance. So the music will sometimes not be as loud as the, what you're experiencing at that moment. I think the, the perfect example of that is in Stella. There's a real weird thing with the sound in that. Especially when the, um, the spaceship's going off and stuff. It's so overpowering. And it only brings the music in when it needs to come in. And some people always complain, well, you can barely hear what the characters say in Nolan films because of this weird way of doing it. But I think that's a lot to do with his biggest commitment, which is cinema. The guy loves cinema. He adores cinema. Hence why we're going back and forth all the time with when's Tenet coming out? Yeah. <laughs> and he's made commitments to try and like make sure that cinema stays alive. And... That can be, you know, that's a great thing, but it brings back that dogmatic nature of him. 
when we actually look at some of the more um I'd say like all authorship has to have a negative tropes to it. So if we look at the other, the more negative tropes, generally speaking, and you might disagree with this, Ryan, but Probably. Nolan is not very well known for having memorable female characters. Mm. His female characters, I mean, I think on his trailer put it down where they basically said like the, the, the wives, there's always a wife character who's, um, you know, in the past has a, some sort of reaction response to what the main character, who's a man, is going through at that moment. And, I mean, it's not to say he can't write female characters, but he's clearly a more male-dominant director, or at least he has been so far. I think that's the thing, is, is Nolan seems to me to be this sort of, uh, uh, like, the, the post-2000s iteration of that classic director, yeah. and possibly the last ever classic film cinema director um, that we might ever see I don't know I, I don't know obviously I can't predict the future but but like it, you can't no believe it or not <laughs> my crystal ball doesn't actually work um, but I, I think that, that that's the thing that's where he fits into this weird category for me where it's like I kind of feel tired of him and yet I still enjoy his films mm. like I think so you can correct me if I'm wrong here this is just my opinion but you look at the films that he's done right they're very stereotypically like uh, you think of the prestige yeah the prestige in the victorian times very male dominated they were magicians you would you would well, you would stretch your arm and go at length to try and find a female magician um <clears throat> inception you could argue you could have a female protagonist um interstellar as well but some of his films are very like dunkirk you probably wouldn't have females like at war yeah this so like he he has picked certain things to play off his sort of um best attributes yeah it's just i know i do agree with you and he does get great performances out of female actresses it's just no one's really remembering the female characters in his films yeah he's yeah he's definitely more male dominant and again can't really fault him for that because a lot of directors are like that mm. it's just um he's carried that trait over into all the other films and it's the same with like i said there are negative aspects to being an auteur because you're going to continue to bring in those sort of themes and um yeah i i I'd kind of I, I mean that's what made tenet look a bit more interesting it was a bit more of a diversifying of the cast because yeah, yeah. generally speaking the classic christopher nolan actor is someone who's got very nice hair, might wear a suit, looks a bit like Christopher Nolan, but more attractive. That's uh, generally speaking, they I always would, look a bit like no, Nolan. No, I disagree with that. Like most of his films. Well, let's talk Memento, Batman. Batman, uh, but it's Bruce Wayne, so he's going to be wearing a suit. He's a millionaire. Maybe not necessarily a suit, the but prestige. They're, just, they're well suited. They're very much, you don't Inception. see him as unkempt, kind of like. Interstellar, he is. Coop is like just this sort of. That's what I mean. Interstellar is that weird one where it's sort of... It, it's definitely the film that feels like it's the most removed from his whole entire... I would say Dunkirk films. is. Because Interstellar still plays with time quite a lot. And it, Dunkirk does as well. But it does it in a very linear way. It's kind of like... It tells you straight off the bat, like, one week. Or, you know... Um, or, yeah, it's one week. And then one day. Whenever it's yeah. cutting between the different sections of the film one hour and you're like oh well I can follow this and then it all kind of I mean, comes to its on an editorial perspective but I mean the kind of characters that you see in Interstellar the sort of story it's telling and the fact that there's no big answer at the end you know like, it's, well I suppose then to sort of back your argument up is that every one of his male antagonists probably barred Dunkirk you could argue to a slight degree Dunkirk because of Tom Hardy and his sacrifice and um, they become heroic in some sort they of way. They become heroes, yeah. yeah. It's their journey to, to heroism. Yeah, which is actually, you, you, can, you can definitely see that throughout his like, filmography. Even Memento still plays with that because yeah. he thinks he's the hero who's trying to solve the case when really he's the guy who fucking started. Well, he starts as a hero, doesn't yeah. he? And because it's backwards, then it... So if you were to do that the other way around, he would be a hero by the end. Do you know what I mean? Well, no, if you remember Memento, he's not the hero. He's the one that killed his wife. and but he's Yeah, no, but and he doesn't not know that remember. initially. Yeah, yeah. So in his story, at the start of the film, he is the hero. Yeah. And I think, like, <clears throat> I think the only other film... The, the two films that kind of do get a bit... You sort of forget that they're Nolan films. Obviously, Following and um, Insomnia. So you're going to say Prestige? No. 
Because the pr pr prestige pretty much fits to everything that Nolan builds. I want to talk about the prestige and in it, a minute. <laughs> the, the, the prestige is also another one that, like, all of Nolan's films are almost like magic tricks in some ways as well, because he's going, this is what, this is going to happen here, and then, boof, how did that happen? And that's the kind of feeling you get from it, obviously more so in The Prestige, but every single set piece is like a magic trick. That you're like, how do you do that? So Insomnia? So Insomnia is more of a, I don't know, it almost feels like a journeyman film. It's Al Pacino, isn't it? Yeah, it's Al Pacino and Robin Williams. Mm. Robin Williams is one of his rare uh, villain roles. It's a perfectly acted film. It's alright, it's absolutely nothing special. Because it doesn't, it plays with time in a different way because it's set in Alaska. And it's set during that time when no light comes through, which then brings insomnia in, of course, which then he, he still gets to play with that idea of time, of that like dreariness instead of jumping through different times. Hmm. But it feels like he just did it because he had to keep his career moving. You know, there's not those distinct Nolan moments. There is uh, another questionable protagonist, sure. But it's definitely... I can't even remember the full story to it. Like, it's just not a memorable film. <laughs> I think as well, at that given point, I wouldn't necessarily say he wanted to keep his career moving. I think his career was moving really quick and he probably already signed up to do that film and then he rushed it or made it quite... It's actually a remake. Had, well, you had Memento mm. and then you had Insomnia and then very quickly you had Batman Begins and then The Prestige. Like, the Batman Begins and The Prestige are what, a year or two years apart? Yeah, I think it goes... Um... And then The Dark Knight was 2008. Well, if we look at the usual, like, Nolan that actually does quite traditional, like most film directors, he does a film every two to three years. Yeah. It's definitely something that he's been consistent with. Memento 2000, Insomnia 2002, Batman Begins 2005, Prestige 2006, 2008 The Dark Knight, Inception 2010, Interstellar 2012. No, no, no. Dark Knight Rises. got the wrong way around. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you heard that bit. Then 2014 would I be... I even mentioned yeah, it earlier. We went to the cinema to yeah, watch yeah, yeah. it. <laughs> and then, of course, three of different Dunkirk. Three it was of 2017, was it? <clears throat> it's like he's just he's just that kind of... I suppose the best word to, for Nolan right now in the, in the cinema industry is reliability. Yeah. Despite the fact that his films aren't reliable in the sense where you're like, oh, I know what I'm going to get here. Because they're never. They're never what you're expecting completely. They're no. always going to blow you away in some sort of capacity. And that's where the difference with Insomnia, for me, it's earlier in his career. He doesn't have all those chips to play with, to be like, I want to do this, I want to do that. Memento is an independent film. Insomnia is a remake of a Norwegian film. So he's got those limitations of what he has to stick to anyway. And you can feel it. He actually feels like a director that does need as much freedom as possible to be able to do exactly what he wants to do. Well, you've seen that quite rightly in the work where he has been given freedom. Yeah. He's done, well, he's excelled. So I was going to mention The Prestige. I did want to talk about The Prestige. Um, I absolutely love The Prestige. And personally for me, I think it's probably one of his best works. Simply, again, with the way that it plays with time. And it doesn't tell you like that it's going to jump. It just jumps and then yeah, you've yeah. got to figure it all out in your head. And then the, the way that it kind of ends and stuff. It, it's almost a cat and mouse game between the two characters. But because it's set over, like, well different stages in time and they're reading each other's journals and stuff it, like it's just a massive head fudge i watched it again recently and um i fell in love with it all over again since the first time i watched it so i just want to know what you guys think about the prestige um i i remember i watched it years ago um, and i remember really enjoying it at the time um and I can't think of any kind of real, <laughs> real point to make on it because I, it's been so long since I've seen it. But that, as, again, that's kind of how I feel about a lot of Nolan's films. Is although there's nothing really to criticise, I, I feel like I don't. I, there's nothing that I get to take away from them where I go, "Oh, that's given me a new understanding or a new thinking mm. on that or this." I, I'm impressed and sort of like, "Wow, how did he do that?" But that's why I always feel a little bit hollow now about about those kind of films. Well, that's it. He is a blockbuster director nowadays rather than a thinker's director. I was going to ask you what you thought of The Prestige. Well, I was about to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> the, Prestige, the Prestige is a fun film. Um, it's, it's a film that to me gets a little bit tied up and gets a bit confusing because of the whole clones and the time jumps. I love the Bowie. Um, yeah, Tesla. The, uh, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And it... It felt like a film that, again, he did the studio pick with Batman Begins. And Batman Begins is, is a great film, but there's clearly still some Warner Brothers control there. 
and then he went off and did a film by himself with um, obviously Christian Bale and Hugh Jackman. That's what The Prestige feels like to me, but that is actually the film that has the worst female characters he has. Those female characters are so weak, they're essentially partner, assistant. That yeah. is literally the female characters. Uh, I think it, you could tell that he's still learning. That's definitely a film that to me is like the learning film. You see with a lot of directors where they step away from the studio and they'll go and make a more creatively interesting film. And you're like, oh, okay, they're capable of doing this. Let's see where they go with that. And that's the vibe I get with The Prestige. But if we go like with the general thing with Nolan, it plays into that thing. He loves magic. He loves puzzles. He loves time. He loves anything that's got some sort of construct to it. And then he'll move that construct around to surprise you. And I think that's a really valuable thing that we need in blockbuster entertainment. And to be honest with you, weirdly, you know how like when there's a director who has such an impact, everybody tries to copy him? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No one's actually tried to be like Christopher Nolan. No, I, think, I, don't films, think, they could. I think films have tried to be like Christopher Nolan, but I don't think any director specifically I, I, that well, I can think of. I think like films have been tried to be like Batman Begins because mm. it's the, the, the first of the successful origin stories. And that's when it got boring because everyone was trying to do an origin story like Nolan's style. Mm. But generally speaking, no one's tried to make an exception. Well, no one's tried to take that sort of mix between it. I mean, you could argue Rian Johnson does mix between blockbuster and some sort of intelligence behind it. He does and he doesn't. It's kind of a like a poor Christopher Nolan. I love Rian Johnson, just for the record. Just because it's an eye doesn't mean it's not Ryan. Um, I love like his work and stuff, but I don't think he's got the craft in the same way that Nolan does. Mm. Um so I think as well with Nolan, the reason that there hasn't been any other like iterations of his style is because it is so in depth and so meticulously thought out in the process and even I imagine like in the editing room and stuff, it's meticulously edited that it's kind of quite hard to replicate that. And even if Ryan Johnson, let's say, for example, he wanted to replicate that, like that takes a lot of dedication. And like you said earlier, Christopher Nolan's um, love for film, that, that's his passion. He yeah. will throw himself into that and he will put all the time and effort into it. Because I don't think maybe necessarily like other directors would do that. And even if they did, they're not going to turn out the same sort of finite piece of work that Nolan does. I think it's interesting because you're right there and he is almost indebted to cinema in itself in the sense that sh no one tries to be him but he's definitely tried to be other people. Yeah. Um, I think he's taken a few bits from different... Yeah, there's, there's two directors I always think about when I think of Nolan. I think of David Lean in regards to the British director who did um, Bridge on the River Kwai and uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Those big epics where it's all about using and utilising... Um, 70 mil using IMAX to give the biggest image possible for cinema and the other director is uh, obviously not as he doesn't go as psychological as this director but as far as consistency and exploration and knowing that it's his film Stanley Kubrick mm, okay. he definitely has Kubrickian sort of elements to it with the, the dependence on um, more practical effects and to really take a story and make it his own you know, that's what Kubrick did so well. You could distinctively see a Kubrick film, and Kubrick tried not to stick to the same genre every time. And arguably, Nolan doesn't stick to the same genre. He may stick to the same tricks that he likes to use, but he'll always explore the genre in a different way. It's like we said about Dunkirk. He's exploring a war film in a very different way. And that kind of started with his... You could tell Dark Knight Rises is a war film. It's built like a war film. Yeah. There's all the underlining issues. And that's probably the only film that actually politically he's tried to actually look at the real world i always find that i mean obviously the dark knight is a reflection on 9 11 and the patriot the chaos and yeah dark knight rises he literally shot during the occupy movement and he plays quite heavily into that with, with bane's idea of the, the elites have overrun but then it also plays with that idea of anarchism going too far which is where like the the the, the political message gets a bit muddled because he's actually doing it for Ra's al Ghul's daughter because he fancies her or whatever. It, he's know, her he protector. Of, it, it steers into a direction <laughs> where you go, it would be more interesting if this is just going, if you listen to these people, like we have nowadays but, where we listen to propaganda. and. I don't think it's anticlimactic. Yeah. Like, it's I've seen films though. where something like that, where your main kingpin, let's say, the antagonist, 
then has been overruled by someone that you've not really focused on that's in the shadows and you feel a bit like underwhelmed by it and you're like oh that, that was a bit shit I mean in all fairness he does that consistently through the Dark Knight trilogy well yeah yeah that's, well, that's it, his thing isn't it it's like Joker yeah. Joker is kind of the kingpin but his ace in the hole as he says was Harvey Dent Scarecrow yeah Scarecrow you think Scarecrow's the main villain but it's Ra's al Ghul who's, yeah he's all in a weird way those particular films subverts I, it's either subverting or he's very much interested in that puppet master idea because it's who's in control here who's, who is control of this order or this chaos and he does that within the crime worlds quite frequently within at least within the, the, Dark, the Dark Knight trilogy it's interesting you said that now because thinking on some of the other films so like Inception it has it as well because you have yeah, Maud, yeah. Maud so who's in control you think Dom's in control but when they start to go deeper into the dreams, Maud starts to come out yeah. and start, and it's like, well, no, she's in control because she, like, is in his head. Yeah. So, it's, and even, like, Interstellar, mm. um, Matt Damon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's one of those weird things for a director who loves to be in control, he likes to question who's in control in his own stories quite often. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's an interesting way to do it. So, guys, we hope you enjoyed our Christopher Nolan chat. Um, remember, this is our final episode of the season, so, um, yeah, please look out for us when we're back. We're back on the 6th of September, so um, we'll probably put a premiere up for it on YouTube. And uh, yeah, as ever, please leave us a like. Give us a comment if there's any Christopher Nolan films you like, you want to talk about, um, share your thoughts. And please subscribe. And also, check out our website. Put the, the link down in the description below, but it is www.trasharts.co.uk. And uh, other than that, guys, thanks for listening. Trash Arts, take out. Ta-da. See you in September.